So yesterday we started, or we, we talked more about yield surfaces. So we had a couple of the main ones that you should know yesterday, Wednesday. Um, so yield uh, criteria. And in that we, we defined a von Mises and a Tresca and a max normal surface, which uh, we say material fails at different points. Uh, depending on what the material is and what the failure criteria is for that. So a max normal stress criteria, we say max normal. Uh, I say, so here in my, in yield space now, I, I, I normally draw this as, or we normally draw this as principal stress space, sigma two, there we go. Uh, if the stress lies within the yield surface, then the material hasn't failed. If it lies outside of it, then it has failed. Uh, and this is our schematic representation of that, or graphic representation of that. If it, uh, for a max normal stress criteria, if, if either of the principal stresses surpass the yield strength and tension or in compression failure happens, Tresca, uh, we kind of cut off the corners of that. So in a Tresca yield criteria, we say, well, if it surpasses the, the axial tension in either direction, then failure is going to happen. Or really what I'm looking for is, is shear. So these two axes along here, uh, or the, the plus minus 45 and plus 135 uh, is a pure shear axis, pure shear. Uh, and this would be by axial tension, tension along here. Uh, and so Tresca, I say, well, if, I, if I'm pulling it in tension and either of them surpass that yield surface, then failure starts to happen. But if I'm shearing it, then failure is actually going to happen lower because really shear is what's going to dominate this failure here. Uh, for a von Mises surface, I take that and I kind of round it out to make it a little bit more continuous. And there are equations for all of these. So this is our von Mises. And so not only am I looking for shear uh, in one of the planes, I'm looking for all of the shears in the body, and so I take a deviatoric stress, which corresponds to my, my distortion. So all, basically any, any shear that's in a material is going to cause it to deform. So I take all of those together and I can draw out a failure surface. And then I showed at the end of lecture that these are, that, so we write these out in terms of print three principal stresses, x1, 2, and 3, sigma 1, 2, and 3. Uh, and so this is actually a failure surface in 3D. So the von Mises surface in 3D, which I'm going to try to draw uh, very poorly, looks like a cylinder in space um, that is oriented. The center of the cylinder is along the 111 direction uh, in my sigma 1, 2, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 space. And so now if I applied a hydrostatic pressure, I would be going along the axis of this cylinder. So there's a few other yield criteria, and I, I gave equations for all of these. There's a few other yield criteria that I want to mention uh, just so that you know them. So these are some of the most common that are, and they're useful generally for isotropic materials. If we have anisotropic materials or pressure dependent materials, there's some other uh, useful common ones that pop up. So. Let's look at other yield criteria. Uh, and so now uh, one of them is, is called a Mohr Coulomb, Mohr Coulomb, which, uh, so I had mentioned that max normal stress criteria is normally used for brittle materials because they generally fail in, in tension. Uh, or compression, uh, and generally that uh, ten that compressive yield strength is a lot higher than the tensile yield strength because in tension uh, the cracks and voids will cause failure to happen a lot earlier, which is what we'll talk about in uh, when we get into fracture, and then in compression those cracks and voids close up and have to shear uh, to fail, which takes a lot more stress to actually cause it to happen. Uh, so a more Coulomb criteria takes that idea and creates basically a pressure dependent yield surface. So uh, it still says shear can cause failure, so it still cuts off 
some of these axes um, and it sort of looks like a Tresca criteria, but then extend it out. So then you would have some yield strength in tension, some yield strength in compression, uh, and if you had shear acting then uh, along any direction, then it would kind of be less than those two. And so this is useful for uh, certain types of materials like concrete, uh, concrete or, or soil, where uh, if you imagine now this is this is effectively pressure dependent so you remember uh, so I just mentioned this this is biaxial tension uh, biaxial uh, compression and so along this axis what we're effectively doing is is packing the material closer together so if you had a loosely packed some granular material when you're packing it together it's harder for that failure to start occurring between the granules. So for those types of granular materials like concrete and soil, um, this, this effectively represents a hydrostatic, uh, an increase in strength due to hydrostatic pressure. There's another useful one that's similar to that called the Drucker-Prager, Drucker-Prager, which is effectively the same type of surface, but then uh, rounded off. So you take that same idea of uh, Tresca versus a von Mises criteria. And for Drucker Prager, you just kind of round out. You still have that anisotropic sigma yield in tension, sigma yield in compression that are fairly different, but now this is a, a continuous surface instead of a piecewise surface. Uh, so again, this is, this is still useful for concretes and soils. Um, this is actually commonly used for polymers too because it turned out, turns out polymers are highly pressure dependent um, because remember they're, they're effectively molecular spaghetti. So as you compress that polymer together, those molecules get squished closer together and it's harder for them to slide relative to each other. Um, so a drucker prager criteria is useful for that. For anisotropic materials, there's a popular one known as a hill yield criteria. So hill criteria Criterion, I guess, uh, which is named after Rodney Hill, who's a famous guy in solid mechanics that comes up a lot. Uh, but before we had that von Mises criteria, um, that is a quadratic yield surface, the Hill criteria takes that and extends it out a bit. So uh, it would look something like this. There we go, it's still my sigma one, sigma two space. And so now what I, I say with the Hill criteria is there's an anisotropic yield in tension, yield in tension one, sigma yield in tension two, yield in tension, sigma yield in tension one. So this is actually useful for highly anisotropic materials like carbon fiber composites. So I'm sure now all of you have seen from the lab the yield strength of the carbon fiber in the fiber direction and not in the fiber direction was very, very different uh, by at least an order of magnitude. And so this type of a criteria, you basically can model that in a continuous yield surface. So you say, well, it's extended out in one direction and it's not so extended out in the other direction. So this would be, say, a matrix direction and this would be the fiber direction. So if I'm pulling it in the fiber direction, it's a lot stronger than the other direction. Do you uh, like base the criteria off of the like, material? So how do you know which one Yep. So it's it's hundred percent based off what material you're using. And each so so these are all again simplified surfaces, uh, conti generally continuous yield surfaces. What you would so do experimentally is actually start loading materials in different directions in different orientations and start seeing where failure occurred along those different axes so you may find like in a certain part of the sample it agrees really well and in another part of the sample it doesn't quite agree so well um, where these would be like actual failure points of a material and so uh, this is generally what you would want to do from an engineering standpoint is, is create a surface that is a conservative estimate. So you would want that surface to lie inside of where all of your potential failures could occur. Um, 
just for safety reasons. But uh, yeah, so it, it's not going to be a perfect match to experiments. This is kind of an approximation we would use to represent a complex stress state. Because again, in an actual part, if I, if I were to take, I don't know, something non-uniform and apply some weird stress to it, the stress at one point isn't just pure tension or pure shear or, or anything. It's, it's a weird mix of that. So these are ways for different materials to figure out if it's going to fail or not. Cool. Questions, thoughts on that? All right. So now, real quickly, I'm going to go through a couple different types, or so now I guess I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and I'm going to go through a couple different types of failures that happen. So, uh, or a couple different loading states that you should know for when uh, that you should know, and and how failure is going to occur in those loading states. So. Um, we talked now about yield surfaces. So for a complex state of stress, how is failure going to occur? What we also need to be thinking about for these materials is what direction will cause failure to occur. So generally, this breaks down into whether a material is brittle or ductile. And so if it's brittle, it'll generally fail in tension. And if it's ductile, it'll fail in shear. And so you need to know uh, what direction those maximum shear and maximum uh, maximum ten maximum shear and maximum tension planes are. So, if we look now at tension, we we talked about this really briefly yesterday. So let's look at different loading states, and let's look at simple tension first. So if I have that bar, a uniaxial bar that I'm pulling in tension, um, I know my principal stresses, if I were to look at them, I would have some sigma in that direction and nothing in the transverse direction. I could also look at a block of material in this at some other orientation, some 45 degree angle, and I would be getting a state of pure shear in this material. So we can look at this, I guess, in terms of a Mohr circle uh, in pure tension. What I'm effectively doing is I say uh, my sigma and my shear space now. Uh, in pure tension, I'm applying some stress in this direction at some 45 degree angle relative to that. I have some maximum shear and some tension in those directions as well. So uh, that maximum shear now is some sigma over 2 uh, tau max is just my sigma over 2. And so now, depending on exactly what that material is, I need to know um, what... So depending on what the material is, I need to know how that stress is going to cause failure to occur. So for a brittle material, I would expect in tension that yield to occur horizontally because it's going to break, it's going to be brittle, which is going to, basically you're going to have cracks and voids that are going to nucleate in tension. But for a ductile material, it's going to fail in shear. So because uh, that, that shear is going to allow dislocation motion and grain, bound, and grain boundary sliding, or grain sliding relative to each other. So when you see now, and this is uh, what we had talked about yesterday, when you see now that uh, material starting to fail in tension, what you have is failure is going to start happening along either one of these 45 degree angles. And it's going to progress uh, gradually along those 45 degrees uh, where you'll see some sort of a shear happening along one direction, some sort of a shear happening along the other direction, shear happening along the other direction, so here, there, and eventually this is going to cause that material, this is going to be what causes that material to neck physically. Oh, that was not the cleanest. Uh, 
there we go. So the reason we see this necking in ductile materials is because we have that shear happening. That shear failure is the dominant thing that's causing, uh, or that shear stress is what's going to cause failure to, to start. So not only when we look at our, our yield criteria, not only is it that we're just surpassing a yield surface that we're starting failure, uh, or that we're causing failure to initiate, but it's actually the shear component of that, and we have to know in what direction that shear component is acting. So for that's kind of the simplest case for tension, I'm going to talk in a little bit more depth about torque now, because that's what you're going to need for next week's lab. Uh, not next week, the week after. So next week will be viscoelasticity, which will be a demo, which is going to be a makeup from last week when our TA was stuck in Japan. Uh, torsion. So torsion, again, so I, I mentioned this really briefly yesterday, and today we're going to go in a little bit more detail about what happens when I torque a beam. So to set up my torsion problem, I'm going to start with a rod um, that's grounded, and I'm going to say I'm going to apply some twist to this, uh, and that twist, uh, let's look from the center, this twist is going to be some angled twist theta. I know at the bottom of the sample, this is going to be, if, if I say this is grounded on one side, I have that twist is varying continuously throughout the body. So um, I have now the amount of twist is some gamma on the surface. Uh, at the neutral plane of this rod, I'm going to have no twist hap or no uh, relative twist happening uh, because it's the center of the body. And at the exterior surface, I'm going to have some maximal amount of twist there. And so uh, let's say this is a bar of length L. I'm going to define a coordinate system here, uh, my x to be there. And so now if I, if I take a look at a square in the body here, I start off initially as, as some square here, and I start off and I, I end up at now a sheared uh, state. So what I can say is this body has been torqued by some amount gamma, depending on where it is on the body and how deep it is into the surface. So what I'm essentially doing with torsion is I'm applying a state of pure shear to my body. So where tension, I'm applying a state of pure uniaxial tension, uh, or, or uniaxial tension, I'm applying a state of pure tension. Here, I'm applying a state of pure torsion. So to figure out now what's going to be happening in this body, uh, first I need to relate the, the twists in the body, gamma, to the applied torque theta. So I know uh, this, this torque is going to be a function of theta or proportional to theta and r, because I know here at the center it's going to be zero. So actually I'm going to say, and, and I know here at the bottom of the body it's not going to be twisting at all. So um, now I'm going to say my amount of twist as a function of these three variables, it's going to vary linearly with my amount of twist, with my theta. Uh, it's going to vary linearly with r, so as I go away from the body, um, and it's going to vary inversely with l. So I have a relationship for the amount of shear strain in a body at an arbitrary point uh, with where that bar is an initial length l, initial radius r, and some angle theta. So now I need to think about what's happening with the stresses inside the body. So uh, for stresses, I have, thank you. So now I'm going to be plotting something similar to how to what I was plotting with the beam case. Um, I'm going to be plotting my R versus the change in angle gamma. Uh, nope. R versus torque. R versus my shear. There we go. So 
I know from my engineering shear strain relationship that the shear stress <coughs> is equal to g gamma, where again that's my engineering shear stress, which I added this thing distinction for, or shear strain. Uh, I keep Can you saying it wrong even here. <coughs> Uh, yeah, so basically as, as the bar is longer, let's see if this makes sense. Uh, yes, so, so I'm applying a, a fixed amount theta to a body. Ooh. Um, and so if I make that bar longer, the relative amount of twist that I'm applying is less than if it was shorter. So you can think about uh, if I had a very short bar that I was twisting some amount theta in here versus so this is some theta this is some L1 and if I had a very long body here and I applied that same amount of twist theta then the relative shear, or the relative change in shear here, would be a lot less for the longer one. There we go. Wouldn't it be x instead of l because that would only give you the even shear strain at the very end, the very end of the bar? Yes, but I. Uh, so, I. Uh, Technically, the, the, the torque should be identical all along the length of the bar. So this, this isn't actually a function of L. So I'm assuming I, I, I put a grounded bar or a ground here on the bottom, but I'm actually just taking a, a body and twisting it in space, uh, and I'm applying that torque relative to a fixed ground. So the shear isn't a function of, of my axial position. Uh, it's just a function of my lateral position, or radial position, not lateral position. Cool. Does that make sense for length? Cool. Can we think of this as finding the slope, almost, yeah. of that kind of twisted line? Basically. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Which is probably how I should have gone about describing it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Okay. So, in this body now, I know my shear stress relates to my engineering shear strain uh, via that shear modulus there. So I can say in the elastic regime, uh, elastic regime, uh, I have my shear is equal to G theta R over L, where theta is my applied twist, R is the beam length, uh, beam radius, and L is the beam length. And so I have some uniaxially varying shear in the body where shear stress is zero at the center and it's maximal at the outer edge of the body. Um, so the <coughs> tricky bit starts to happen when we get into the plastic regime. So now, how much detail do I want to go into one? Uh, not too much detail because I'm going to run out of time. So. Uh, this I'll talk about this probably next, not next Monday, the Monday after uh, the midterm, because that's when it'll be relevant for your beam lab. But we can say that now the body starts to yield when the amount of twist, when when that tau uh, reaches my my yield shear, because I'm applying a state of pure shear in the body, and so what'll happen after I hit that point? So I, I can figure out now uh, a couple things. For a beam of fixed uh, length or a beam of fixed radius, I can figure out what my, or a beam of fixed twist, I can figure out what the, the theta yield is for a certain, uh, how much twist I need to apply for a certain bar to cause it to fail, uh, which would be tau yield L over GR, or I can figure out for a certain amount of twist, uh, so this would be for fixed um, fixed R and fixed L. But really, what's actually interesting is, so after I start to yield, uh, 
what's going to happen is I'll start hitting that yield strength at some internal R here, some tau, and I'll have a linear elastic deformation and then a plastic deformation starting to happen outside of the body. Or starting to happen, sorry, outside of the yield point where this is now some point where yielding starts to happen. And what I effectively see is that same sort of um, elastic and then plastic behavior happening, except now radially varying in the body. And so I can figure out where that radial, uh, where that ra yield radius is, uh, where this Ry is based on um, my tau yield L over G theta. And so the tr uh, once we can figure out where that yield radius is, now effectively what we need to solve is a, is a torque balance on the body to figure out how much torque I need to apply to cause uh, this beam to start failing plastically. And that's what I'll start talking about next Monday um, is how we relate now this shear yield to the applied torque on the body uh, and relating that to, to all these twists and, and R and L variables. But the important thing to know is that the, an applied twist on a body is going to cause a yield, uh, stress that's going to be maximal at the outer edge of the surface. Um, let's talk about beam bending really quick, factor of safety, and then I have a couple conceptual questions that we'll get through. So that was a quick intro into torsion. Let's talk now about beam bending. <coughs> ah, sorry. Okay, so now we remember for a beam that's being bent, uh, let's apply, let's say for some beam like this. So it's being bent um, with some moment M. I can say now the stress in the surface is varying linearly across, uh, this is my x direction, the stress I assume initially is varying linearly relative to the neutral axis, so I have uh, some amount, no, this is backwards, relative to my z, sorry, relative to my z, there we go. I have some stress in the body. I assume it's linear inside uh, relative to the neutral axis. And so now I want to figure out when plastic deformation is starting to happen. So for this, you remember, I guess if we have a moment and, and an applied shear on the body, some Q, then we have both an axial and a shear stress Generally, when I am thinking about plasticity, the moment is going to be such a dominant, uh, such a dominant stress contributor over the shear, uh, internal shear, that I, I I'm just going to ignore the shear stress, um, which, from the beam bending lab, should have been like a factor of ten ish, right? Different, maybe, maybe. No, I'm just curious to see if anyone actually remembers relative magnitudes of shear stress versus axial stress. It was, the axial was definitely a lot. Do you like ballpark, like factor of 10, okay. factor sure. of 5? <laughs> sure, okay, cool. So generally it should be a lot higher. Um, <laughs> and so for plasticity, we'll ignore it for the sake of simplicity. Uh, and we'll say that plastic deformation can start to happen when, uh, so now I say uh, sigma, the stress in the body is mz over i. Um, and so I can find out, I know uh, now the maximal, when, when this stress starts to hit my yield stress, I'll start to yield. So I can figure out the moment where yielding will start to happen 
uh, by saying this is where my shear stress hits my yield stress uh, I, to my moment and my distance away from the axis, which now I'm just going to call my h over 2, uh, where this total height here is h. And so the distance from the maximum distance from the neutral plane is just that h over 2. So I can figure out what moment I have to apply to start yielding happening in the body. And what's going to start happening initially uh, is this is going to progress. I'm going to have, uh, so if I, if I have a perfectly uniform moment in the body, uh, which is generally not the case, let's, let's say I have three-point bending. So if I have three-point bending in the body, uh, da, 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 there we go. I know the maximum moment also happens at the center point of the beam because I have that moment displacement diagram looks something like this uh, where the moment relative to P uh, and X M is PL over 4. So initially the bending, the maximum bending will start here or I guess at the top and bottom if you assume the yield is symmetric in uh, tension and compression that yield will start to grow in the body. So you'll start to see kind of a, a larger yielding take place because you remember the neutral plane uh, doesn't have any stress. So I'll, I'll start reaching some, as, as this moment increases, wherever I have that MY, uh, I can, I'll effectively say that all of this part of the body is yielding and I'll have uh, this kind of plastic zone here and eventually what's going to happen is that plastic zone will join together and I'll get a plastic, uh, what do I call it, a hinge, plastic hinge forming, where, you know, something like that. And then depending on whether my material is hardening or uh, elastic, perfectly plastic, or whatever, generally local failure will start to localize in that plastic zone of the beam. So what that looks like schematically is in the center of the beam, I'll start to hit a yield stress, and then depending on whether it's elastic, perfectly plastic, or hardening, um, I'll say this is some yield, this is again my, uh, my sigma, and my Z. So I'll hit that yield strength. Um, this could perfectly plastically deform or it could have some hardening or even some softening behavior here, um, depending. But uh, in the analysis, generally we assume perfectly plastic for deriving a couple of simple analytic relationships. Uh, sigma Y, and then Finally, in the center of the beam, what's gonna, what this is going to end up looking like. So this is where I have just some plasticity in this beam. So I can see to make this look a little bit cleaner. Uh, what's going to happen, finally, is I'll have something that is effectively so steep that it just looks like, a, uh, like, like it doesn't necessarily exist. Sigma Y, stress Z, and I can say now at this point when that height of the beam that's failed is so much higher than the plastic point, uh, I will have formed a plastic hinge. And so uh, here, here I have some amount of plasticity in the ex extremities of the beam and the top and bottom surfaces, and then eventually it will just deform like that. And what I should have done is brought a paper clip um, because you can see this demonstrated really nicely with a paper clip. Or if you take it and start bending it, you'll just see it start to localize. The failure will start to localize in one point, and you'll end up kind of with a hinge there that'll deform more significantly, um, because that plastic hinge will, uh, won't be able to carry any increased load. So now the, the load or the force in that, uh, that it takes to bend that section will plateau, and it'll just kind of become a hinge that you can move with a constant force. Cool. So, um, 
there are equations that I can talk through for that that I might talk through when we talk through torsion plasticity. Um, but you can calculate out um, now this uh, the z yield height uh, and the z yield height that will eventually cause it to form a plastic hinge and the, the final moment ratios if it's elastic or vertically plastic. But for the sake of time, because yep, I don't have a ton of time, we're going to stop there and come back to that later. So questions or thoughts on this before we jump to the next thing? Okay, so one last thing for, uh, for the midterm is going to be factor of safety. So this I'm going to talk about really briefly, um, but basically what we want to know is how much stress there is in the body, uh, or how much stress we're applying in the body relative to what a safe stress threshold is. So I'm going to call this a factor of safety or uh, a safety factor. Um, they're kind of both used interchangeably. And I'm going to call this the yield strength over the working strength. Um, yield strength over the working stress. There we go. Uh, or this is my yield stress over, uh, I'm going to here now define some generally an equivalent stress. Equivalent stress. Most of the time I'm going to define this using a, a von Mises criteria, von Mises, or uh, potentially a Tresca criteria. So I'm either going to define this as uh, two times the max yield strength or just the, the von Mises stress, where my equivalent stress, uh, my von Mises uh, equivalent stress, stress is equal to uh, that long square root thing that I had written up before, one half sigma one minus sigma two <coughs> squared plus uh, one minus three plus one half sigma two minus sigma three. So let the rest of that. And so this is effectively, this factor of safety is effectively defining how far a material is from failure. Far a material is from failure. And so for a safe engineering design, it, this, this basically depends for an arbitrary body you're going to have some amount of stress that's being applied to it based on the environmental conditions. So say you have a car driving on down the road, you have a shock connected to a suspension arm, and that shock is going to take a certain amount of load depending on how much, how hard of a bump you're going to hit. So, or I guess what the weight of the car is generally, and on top of that, how much stress there is from a bump in the road. And so that bump in the road is going to cause a certain amount of stress on the arm, that uh, basically you're trying to figure out what that stress on the arm, where from the stress on the arm, what the maximum von Mises stress is in the material, and you're going to compare that to a yield strength. And so uh, depending on how exactly you know what stresses there are going to be in the body, you can make this factor of safety bigger or smaller. Uh, generally for different industries, there's different amounts of precision you need. So you can imagine now for if you want to make something safer, basically the easiest way to do it is to make it bigger and beefier, so you add weight. Um, so if you want to make a structure as lightweight as possible, you want to get this factor of safety as low as possible. So if you look at something like the aerospace industry, uh, factor of safety for aerospace um, or space is generally, ar generally around like 1.2, 1.25-ish, uh, depending on the component. So they really want to get it tight to make sure things aren't going to fail. Um, or for something like 
automotive this is is probably more like 1.5 to, to 2 probably more on the 2 side um, for something like civil or buildings uh, this can be something on the order of like 3 to 8 depending on exactly how well you know the design criteria and oftentimes so the, the biggest problem with this is you're starting to use statistics based on uh, normally earthquake data which is sporadic so you would say if there's a 8.0 earthquake that's going to happen uh, I know that'll happen once every 5,000 years and so uh, with some probability and so if that if that earthquake hits, I need to have my building survive this magnitude earthquake, which I know is going to cause these stresses in my building. Um, which is why a lot of the time for these sorts of civil structures, they overshoot it. What would they overshoot? What would be a normal working load based on wind or or people or stuff in the building um, to err on the side of caution for if a catastrophe happens, if a if a natural disaster hits, like an earthquake or a typhoon or whatever. Um, which in Seattle is apparently going to happen sooner or later because uh, we're relying on a fault line. So, uh, cool. So, there's a couple conceptual questions that I wanted to ask. Oh, there's no time. We only have like one minute left, and I wanted to do a poll everywhere, but I don't think there's actually time for it. Do it quick. So, so there was one that I was going to put up yesterday. This one is a simple one, um, and this will kind of help to nail down von Mises Tresca. So, so if we assume a ductile material with a von Mises criteria, when is failure going to happen with a hydrostatic pressure? If, if we if the yield strength is sigma y and we apply a hydrostatic pressure with sigma y, will it fail? And if not, then how much extra stress do we have to apply? It's a long one. So we're getting some mixed results. Uh, take a couple of seconds and talk about it with your neighbors. So question on the difference between yield stress and yield strength. Uh, I use them interchangeably, okay. which is yeah. Okay. But also it draws here and so we push part of the direction Okay. Let's come back together. Or let's just keep talking. Does anyone wanna give an answer and explain why? Or explain their answer? And so no matter what happens if we apply 50 times the yield strength. Yeah. So, so it would still not, so it would still not fail. So if we look at what we're essentially doing. Well, there we go. 
uh, like this one here, uh, I would effectively have sigma y minus sigma y, so zero and zero and zero for all of these terms, and so I would have zero equivalent stress. Um, and so un that means failure isn't ever gonna happen no matter what my yield strength is or what my hydrostatic pressure is. And the way you can think about that is you're basically moving along the center axis of this yield surface in 3D. So you're never going to, under the von Mises criteria, you're never gonna fail under hydrostatic compression or tension, which for compression actually may be a valid assumption, for tension probably isn't, but uh, okay. Monday, we'll start talking about data analysis. Thanks, everyone, for sticking it out. I'll see you next week. Peace.